everyone. I'm really privileged to be here today to introduce Professor David Morris, and he is the John E. Brick Elliot Santinantia Santinantia Professor in Geological Sciences and the Jackson School of Geosciences Associate Dean for Research at the University of Texas at Austin. He holds an undergraduate degree from Panama College and an MS and PhD from the University of Washington before joining UT faculty, University of Texas faculty. Uh, he was a senior research geologist at Exxon Upstream Research Company and then a faculty member in the Department of Earth, Atmospheric and Planetary Sciences at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He is a fellow of the American Geological Geophysical uh, Union. Dr. Merck's research focuses on the application of transport processes to understanding the evolutions of landscapes on Earth and Mars. All right. He studies the behavior of topography generated at the interface between granular, granular material and a moving fluid from very short to very long time and space scales, with particular emphasis on processes controlling channel and coastline formation, something very important also for us here. Results from his studies of the Aryan, uh, riverine, coastal, and submarine landscapes have been published in over 100 peer-reviewed journal articles. I'm going to give you the floor to start the presentation. Well, thank you very much. And I want to begin by thanking everyone who was involved in, in getting me and my colleague, Bell German, to, to the American University of Beirut. It's a great honor to be here. And hopefully my talks today will, will make you think that it was uh, time worth spent to, to get us uh, here, because I know it was a bit of a challenge. Uh, this morning, I'm going to be talking about extreme events and how we are at the University of Texas and in the Jackson School of Geosciences in particular, how we are addressing those by uh, developing a science to, to understand change associated with, the, with extreme events and then ultimately fold that into numerical models and other ways to predict what the consequences of those extreme events may actually be. And I had originally thought, well, I have colleagues who work on flash floods and gravel transport, and I know you have flash floods and steep gravel transport uh, rivers here. I'd love to chat with anyone here who's interested in that, but I decided that I was really gonna focus on our most recent truly extreme event. We are in Texas, I don't know if blessed is the right word, but we, we have extreme tropical storms, which uh, we call hurricanes in, in the Atlantic. And we had a recent one in the fall of, of 2017, and it had a tremendous effect on, on our state and on our communities. And I wanna share with you some of the science that we're doing to understand the consequences of Hurricane Harvey. And then I'll also talk a little bit about Hurricane Ike, which was the last truly devastating uh, hurricane that we had in the state of Texas. And I'm going to focus in, I have many uh, co-conspirators here, groups of students and other research scientists within the school that are involved in this, and I'm going to show you information from three places, uh, two along the coast, one very near Corpus Christi, one in, in the central coast uh, near the Brazos River Delta, and then one right outside of Houston. Austin, Texas is right here. This is where the University of Texas is. This is Houston, the largest city in the state of Texas. And the Trinity River is just to the east of there. And we had, I work on that river and have been for a decade now because it is, again, blessed with extreme events. So I'm interested in land change and predicting land change. And Hurricane Harvey in a day and a half dropped 1.1 meters of rain in, you know, in 48 hours. That, and what happened when that event occurred is truly amazing, and I want to show you some of the results of that. Okay, so here is Hurricane Harvey. Hurricane Harvey, which was a big tropical storm that actually moved across the Atlantic the way these, these storms do, and then died into a tropical depression for a number of years, ramped up again into a major storm very, very quickly. It, it, is, it is safe to say that it caught us by surprise. We did not expect it to develop into a, a class three and almost four hurricane right when it hit the coast. 
But that wasn't the real surprise of Harvey, though I'm going to talk about coastal erosion in, in just a couple minutes. The real surprise is that it moved inland and it, and it, it persisted as a tropical depression for, for almost a, a week, uh, dropping amounts of rain that we had not ever seen and causing flooding that we had never anticipated. And uh, while I could go on and on about that, I will just focus on a natural system rather than, than on the implications to, to, the, to the city of Houston. So we were looking at an event that ran for about a week. And let me show you what we, uh, how we put together the data to understand the effects of this very large storm on our system. Immediately after the storm, the first thing that was done by our school is that we flew airborne LIDAR. So airborne LIDAR is, 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 is just a distancing um, laser that allows us to get very high resolution topographic maps. And more importantly, it allows us to remove the vegetation so we get very high resolution bare earth maps in addition to being able to characterize the the uh, vegetation in the area. So we flew almost the whole state, and, and you can see that's 200 kilometers there. So almost 1,000 kilometers, well, 800 kilometers of coastline within two days of, of the hurricane um, actually making, making land. But that wasn't the only thing that we were interested in. I'm very interested in coastal change, so this, of course, was a very important record for me. But there is also a tremendous amount of infrastructure along the coast. And there was a great concern about what the status, particularly of that oil and gas infrastructure is. So we're involved in understanding how it uh, may have been compromised by these storms as well. And then we're, the whole coast is a very important uh, migratory pathway for the birds of all of, all of North America. So a, a great deal of effort goes into assessing the bird habitat along the coast. And we focus there as well. So here's sort of a roadmap for what we're going to do. And I'm going to make a, a pitch right now about what we're trying to do within the Jackson School. And, and particularly, in this case, my, my research group. Uh, there is a lot of work done to understand how these storms lead to inundation uh, by co coastal waters into coastal settings. And those kinds of models are pretty mature. And I'm going to show you the results of those numerical models in just, just a bit. But these, these storms, the impact on the land surface is much more severe than just temporary flooding. There is significant change in the, the landscape that we need to understand better, because that change happens in two places, at the coastline and along rivers. And of course, people live at the coast and along rivers. So we, we need to understand that change. So we're going to look at modification to the coast that's, whoops, I went too far, uh, that's associated with net landward transport. There's also then a lot of net seaward transport that we're going to look at. And we're, I'm going to discuss something that we're finding that once we have a big event, the shoreline becomes much more susceptible to other modifications by much smaller events. One of the challenges we have as, as the environment changes is it's becoming clear that if a big storm happens locally, then the impact of smaller storms that may be happening thousands of kilometers away have an outsized um, contribution to change because the, the system has been so compromised. So I'm going to talk about that. And then we're going to look at what this flooding associated with 1.1 meters of rain in a day and a half actually did to, to our neighborhood. So but first, I'm going to talk about coastal change. I know a lot of your coast is, is rocky here. And, and our coast in Texas is far from rocky. It's a, it's a lot of, of, of fairly loose sediment. But, but beaches and sediment are, are clearly important in, in any environment that, that has a coastline associated with it. So I'm sure that some of this will be of, of interest to you as well. I'm going to look at uh, three things. One is, uh, this is after uh, Hurricane Ida, actually. This happened in 2010 in the, on the central Texas coast. 
Uh, there are certain deposits that are brought landward, and you can see those deposits right here. There was a tremendous amount of beach erosion. I'll show you those volumes in just a few minutes. That landward directed material uh, acts to, to build the coastline, grade the coastline, and what elevation that sediment actually is deposited on affects what plants grow on it and actually then in turn affects what its resiliency to future storms are. So one of the things we're very interested in is, is what, it, what are the elevations that are built associated with, the, with sediment that's moved from the coastline inland and how do we predict what those elevations are gonna be so that we understand how resilient the new land may actually be to future storms. A lot of sediment gets moved offshore. That is um, a problem in Texas because it often gets moved offshore to the point where it doesn't come back onshore for decades. So in terms of, of engineering practices, it, it's, it's essentially lost from the system. On geologic timescales, not so much, but on engineering timescales, it is. So we're gonna look at some on offshore transport, and then a lot is mo moved alongshore, and that has, um, it affects things locally, but not so much when it comes to, um, uh, well, uh, the, the, the net system, because that sand goes somewhere else uh, along the, the shore of Texas. So airborne LIDAR has been uh, a revolution for us and for everyone uh, in engineering and, and earth science who is wanting to understand how Earth's surface is changing with time. There's someone right behind me. <laughs> um, I, I'll show you a couple maps in, in, in just a minute, but what, what we have here, I'm gonna start with an example of, of how the coast is changed by a big storm. And this is from Hurricane Ike, which came by in 20, 2008, so just 10 years ago now. And what you're looking at is, this is an aerial photograph of the Hurricane Ike sediment that was eroded from this area. This is a map showing the pattern of erosion and deposition associated with Hurricane Ike. And the thing to take away is that all the reds are erosion, and these are erosion up to a, a meter or more, and all the blues, the cool colors, are deposition. And the other thing then is here you can see the scale. And what you can see here is that the amount of erosion, the swath of the beach that was lost by this hurricane was essentially 75 meters. So when you integrate that over the, the length of the coastline that was affected, this, this particular storm removed something like 500 square kilometers of the, of the state of Texas in, in about a day and a half. So these are, these are of great concern to us. I mean, Texas is a big state, and I'll talk about that this afternoon more. But even in Texas, we hurt when we lose that much land. So, so we want to understand that better. This is now what, what happened in that particular area. So what I'm, let me go back. We're going to look right along this transect right here, and we're going to look at the change in this system. Uh, and so here now is a cross section along that system. And in the dashed line is what the coast looked like prior to the storm. And so this is the beach, this is the coastal dune. There's a windblown sand dune, vegetated sand dune on the coast. After the storm came through, and this is the picture associated with that. After the storm came through, this is what the beach looked like. So you can see the, the erosion here. I guess right here it was about 50 meters of, of, of erosion. And a lot of that sediment then was eroded up and over and deposited in the bay on, on the other side. And now, if we're gonna understand this accurately, we need to know a couple things. We can estimate the inundation. That's the easiest thing. To, the piling up of water is the easiest thing to, to physically calculate. Getting the waves right is a lot harder, and I'm gonna talk about that in just a moment. But clearly, we know the waves in the water. Then, how does that interact with the pre-existing topography to actually tell us where we expect significant change to actually occur? So, uh, just to point this out here, this is this break and slope right here, you can actually see right there. And then this break and slope of the deposit, you can, you can see right there. So you can see there was a landward shift basically of the high part of the beach of um, about 75 meters. And we wanted to know, because we have models that predict what happens, but we have very little data that actually tells us when it happens. We go before the storm, 
and we come back after the storm, and then we run a model to tell us what happened. And that's not good enough. What we need to know is actually what happens during the storm. And so I have been involved with both instrumenting the coast to measure that, with, but also to then look at the deposits to get a sense of when things are actually happening on the coast. And here is an, here is an example of that. You can see here's a, a team of our, of our graduate students. This is the deposit shortly after, after Hurricane Ike happened. We, we, tr we ended up trenching 100 meters of this deposit. Hopefully you can see right here, this is the, the old buried soil. You can still see the grasses sticking out right here. This is the sediment that was moved during Hurricane Ike. This is the accretion that happened on the, on the beach there. And again, the vegetation that, that lives on the surface is very sensitive to the elevation of that surface. So if we want to predict the resiliency, we need to be able to say what elevation uh, these deposits actually uh, agreed to. Here's what the downstream end of that uh, deposit actually looks like, and hopefully you can see this. It comes down, it's flat topping, and then hopefully you can see these clinoforms here. It looks like a, a classic delta that is growing into the bay, and it is aggrading or, or climbing upward as it's growing into the bay. And this ends up being very important because mm -hmm we had monitors of water level in the bay. And we knew how elevation in the bay was rising and when it was rising relative to the storm. And we have this data that we know very accurately what these elevations are. And this represents the shoreline plus or minus the water depth going over the top plus or minus you know, 10, uh, well, 10 to maybe 30 centimeters. So this actually preserves in it a record of when the beach was being eroded and when the washover was being deposited. So this is, this is a, a scientific drawing corrected for, uh, uh, for distortion showing the downstream end of this, this deposit that's being eroded from the beach. And you can see it's climbing here. Part of it was eroded during the falling stage. And again, its progradation and aggradation was set by what was happening here with the water level in the bay, which fortunately we were measuring. And so here, here are the measurements of what the water level was doing. We're gonna start there first. What we have here in the lighter gray, this is the water level on the seaward side of the, co of the coast. Of, of, in this case, it's a barrier island. So, this is the open sea side, and the dark line is in the bay. A couple things to see. There's a lag in the, the rise of the water. That isn't surprising. The storm's coming from the sea. It's piling water up onto the coast, and it takes uh, a while for the water levels to rise on the bay side just because it's, it's further away in, from where the storm is coming. But ultimately, the water levels in the bay are much, much higher than on the island, which also is not surprising, because eventually the island becomes totally inundated. The water just flows over. But the land at the, down, at the landward side, that's the ultimate backstop that water piles up on. So in Texas, the, the flooding is always more severe on the protected bay side. The waves aren't as bad, but the water levels are much, much higher. So what's interesting is that we were able to estimate, and if you're interested, we can talk about the sediment transport reasons for this, uh, but between that little delta shape that I showed you and our estimates of, of water depth moving the sediment over the, the fan, we were able to, to get an estimate of the water depths at which all the erosion on the beach happened. And this dashed line is when the hurricane actually made landfall. And what you can see is, sure, there's some, there's, some, there's some uncertainty there, which translates into uncertainty in time, which is right here, when this, all this happened. But what is very clear is that all of the erosion happened well before landfall. And so this is a, a definitely a case where the, the combination of the waves and the collapsing waves associated with the surge on the beach were much more effective at eroding the coast than water inundation itself. Once water levels got high in this system, it, 
the waves just translated across, and, and there, was, there was not nearly the same amount of uh, erosion happening. So that, that was not predicted by our numerical models of, of when this would happen, but it, it provides us with a benchmark for those, those sorts of models. And another thing, and, and for those of you who think about coastal waves, uh, this one is particularly important. If you, if you use Swan or, or X Beach or um, AdCirc, all of these, they tend to calculate uh, local wave conditions associated with local wave depth. But when you look at this plot down here, there's wave height and wave period, and you can see these things are either in, in many seconds and many meters in height. The waves that were actually hitting the beach were, were far field waves. They were not in equilibrium with the local conditions. So we actually can't use the, the hindcast storm surge model to accurately estimate the, uh, the beach erosion conditions here because that model uses local wave conditions and predict waves that are much, much lower than this. So we're working now to try to, to do better at that. So what happened this fall? What happened when we, um, this fall in, in, in 2017, uh, we had our next big hurricane. This is Hurricane Harvey. And these are just two cross sections the, the, the green line, they're both taken from here. This is a difference map. It doesn't really look like much, the difference map. So we'll just look at these profiles. This is what the beach looked like before Harvey. This is what the beach looked like after Harvey. There was not a lot of washover associated with Harvey. Harvey came in in less than a day, was a big storm. But, and if you looked at the coast, the coast was fairly linear beforehand and fairly linear afterwards. And so if you just looked at an unregistered photograph, it didn't look like anything happened. But in fact, a great deal had happened. You can see that, that many meters, so here's, uh, you know, these are in meters here, many meters of, of the, the coast was lost. So in this case, in, in less than a day, 60 kilometers of the state of Texas disappeared. And so we're trying to uh, un understand that a little, bit, a little bit better. But let me show you what the, what the system looks like, because it's sort of interesting. So here is the, the, the little beach scarp that develops um, as, as this is at the, at the, the end of the modern day beach. A lot, the old, the pre-existing beach is, is now 50 meters out into the, to the Gulf of Mexico. And here are some of my students looking at this, at this erosional scarp. And what's interesting here is you can actually see these are the Shelley debris from the last big hurricane. So there's a whole record of these events. And in, in this case, the older hurricane deposits are actually armoring the surface. If there hadn't been older hurricanes, this would have eroded even more. So, so even though these were very erosive agents, later on in their life, their deposits actually act to, acted to keep this area um, more resistant than it might otherwise have been. But in some places we did have, so we're trying to, we're looking at that standard beach erosion and what's new is that in, in coastal science we've, we've gotten really good at, and, and we think about things in profile view a lot. Because a lot of coastlines are relatively linear um, and so we're just looking from onshore to offshore. But with longshore transport typically being more than half of the movement of, of sediment on, on almost every case I've ever looked at, you have to look over long distances. So what we're trying to do is develop models that predict the evolution of change over many, many hundreds of kilometers. And that means we have to simplify the model some, but if we put the right physics in it, we're hopeful that they'll, they'll be of important predictive um, utility. So here, here is another one of these difference maps. This is what the deposit after Hurricane Harvey looked like. So this, this, all this sand here used to be out here in this beach. The hotter colors are areas of erosion. All the blues and purples are, are areas of, of deposition there. And this is an area that we were interested in, um, partly because uh, this is, oh, it's not on this map. The, we have a, a major intercoastal waterway that handles billions of dollars of traffic uh, Every, every year, and it is actually, you can actually see boats going up and down it right there. 
we're in danger of this waterway becoming an open ocean case because there's so much beach erosion happening. This is, uh, in, this, in this area, there's only 100 kilometers, I mean 100 meters separating the open ocean from, from our intercoastal waterway, and it's a, it's a great concern. But we were interested in understanding, again, what was controlling the elevation of this deposit. You can see it building out into the marsh here because ultimately that affects the kind of plants we put on here, that affects the rate at which the plants grow, the root density, and how susceptible they are to erosion by, by, other, by other storms. Uh, when we started to trench this, I'm a, I'm a geoscientist, so I've never, you know, yeah, a, a trench and a machete are my operational tools, I mean, and so are my computers and things, but I'm happiest with a trench and a shovel. And so you can see here's, here's one of our undergraduate students uh, monitoring this, and we were really surprised. So here's the deposit, but right in the middle of the deposit, there's, there's a layer here that clearly is a time of shutdown. So something, it, the system stopped, and then it started up again. And my hypothesis was, well, okay, Hurricane Harvey came in, and there were, so this, these are tide records. Pay attention only to the green one right now. Um, these are showing that the, the elevated tides and water surface elevations for a few days, and I thought, well, maybe one of these low tides was, was a time of shutdown in this area, and, and we're just, we're seeing that activity recorded in there, because I want to know how long these things build for and uh, to, to, to do a better job of modeling them. So just in big, bold letters there. You know, it's always good to make a hypothesis. We always go out, and the first thing we do is we write down our hypotheses. This is what we think is going on, because you learn only, at least I learn only, when I say this is what I think is going on, and then when I'm wrong, which is still more than half the time, I, I've just given, I've accepted the fact that I'm always going to be wrong as much as I'm right. Um, I learned something. It wasn't that at all for the following reason. This is, this is the deposit, this is an aerial photograph that was taken right after the storm. That, that photograph was taken at the same time this distancing laser high resolution map was being collected. We went and surveyed in with just a laser theatolite where the deposit was um, about 46 days later. And it, we had to wait because the bridge was washed out and it was not trivial to get here. So we came later and you can see that there was a lot of the deposit that had moved, but it wasn't moved by Hurricane Harvey. It was moved by something else. It turns out that we had a remarkable hurricane season in the southern U.S. In last fall, and there were three particularly big ones. There was Hurricane Irma that hit Florida very hard and the whole southern east coast, and there was Hurricane Nate that uh, hit eastern Louisiana and Alabama. And then we came out at this, at this time right here. It is very, and so what I've plotted here is wave energy per unit area. This is Harvey. Now this was the local storm. This was cl clearly the big storm. But we've now seen this twice, that a big storm that hits locally sort of unzips or uh, it, it, it removes all the protection, particularly in terms of vegetation, from the, from the area. So that later storms that, I mean, this was thousands of miles, both of these were thousands of kilometers away. But yet one of them significantly reworked the Texas coast. Now when we talk about storms, we always think about just local. You know, when, when, tex when you're in Texas, everyone can, can read off, well, everyone who is obsessed with hurricanes can read off this, you know, all the hurricanes that hit Texas. But what we've now found in the case of both Harvey and Hurricane Ike is that they were such big storms that storms that actually hit Florida at, impacted our coast. If, if that other storm hadn't happened beforehand, we probably wouldn't have seen much of an effect. But because the big local storm devastated the ecology of our coastline, far field events totally impacted our area. So we have, to, we have to look beyond the state to really understand how susceptible we are to, to change. So Hurricane Harvey also did something really fascinating. Uh, 
which was reverse flow. So this is a map, this is from, from Erdic, so this is the big coastal uh, surge and uh, hazards assessment model that comes out of University of North Carolina, Notre Dame, and the University of Texas. And this is, this is, this is water surface at the time of the storm um, making landfall. And what you can see here, the hot colors, the yellows, these are high water surface elevations. The cool colors are low water surface elevations. And on Jose Island, San Jose Island right here, you can see that the water levels were actually higher on the back side of the barrier island than on the seaward side of the barrier island. And this drove tremendous over, overland flow in the opposite direction and did some really cool things that I'll show you in just a minute. That is particularly interesting because reverse flow currents like that move a lot of sediment well offshore and it is definitely lost from, from our system. So here's what that area, so just that area that I just showed you, this area right now, we're gonna look at one of those high resolution topographic maps. Here's that topographic map pre-storm, so just a few months before the storm. Uh, this, is, this is the ocean, this is the water surface in the darkest blue here. You can see there, there are a couple beach ridges in here. There are remnants of some older beach ridges in there. You can see some evidence of older hurricane or, or tropical storm wash over there. But that's the beach um, about six months before the storm hit. That's the same part of the beach uh, right after, two days after the storm hit. And these channels, which I think they look like heads of broccoli. My student thinks they're ba baobab trees from uh, Madagascar. Um, the water drained in and out and cut. Uh, these channels are as much as two meters below sea level um, and, and, and removed a tremendous, tremendous amount of, uh, of, of sediment from the system. And exactly how these are developing are something that we're, we're working on right now. Um, you can see this funny thing here that just looks like a, um, a rectangle. That's actually a barge, and I'm going to show you a picture of that next. A barge that had been moored on the bay that got ripped up, the, the cables got ripped, and it just floated out, and now it's caught within you know, 50 meters of the coastline. But it's a kilometer on land, and they, don't, and, and they, they transport flu, uh, fuel, so they are... No one knows what to do. Cutting them apart and moving them is because their hazardous waste in them is going to be very expensive. So they're basically just sitting there. So let me show you what those uh, actually look like. So, so here's, one of, here's, here's the aerial photograph of the barge with some of these reverse channels. Here's a nice 3D rendering of those reverse channels. Uh, they actually behave like waterfalls and nick points. Uh, and there's a, there's a hydraulic uh, transition that happens right here. So we can use... Uh, waterfall mechanics to estimate how these things are actually eroding. Um, you can see the barges floated almost all the way to the coast, but they got caught up on just the little remnant of the dune field that was topographically high that it couldn't get over. And there they sit uh, fully uh, a year later. Here's another picture of, of, so I'm standing right here looking seaward. You can see the barge off to the side there and you can see the op open Gulf of Mexico right there. And so this data plus the surge data plus the wave data and what we know about transport is, is developing a new set of models for us to look at land change in, in, in this part of the world. You can see, by the way, that, that you see how they branch out right in the low topography. You can see that they, they, they're very, very strongly affected by both the pre-existing topography and the vegetation. I thought that when I went out here originally that this was actually going to be muddy and, and, and I knew the beach sand was sandy. But in fact, it's all sand. The only difference is this has a, this has a, a very dense root network, the, the vegetation that lives in the back barrier area and this has low vegetation and that is what holds it up. So we're, we're going on with this kind of work. I'd be happy to talk with anyone who wants to, to hear more about it uh, while we're here for the next few days. Um, I'm here at your disposal, so you know, I, I can talk night and day if you want to talk night and day. That's, that sounds great. 
I want to move on now and talk about rivers because and what happened during this storm to the Trinity River. It, uh, we're very proud of the Trinity River in Texas because it's the, uh, it's the largest river that the catchment is entirely inside the state of Texas. So it's, a, it's the most Texas of Texas rivers. Here is one of these, these great uh, DEM, very high resolution DEM uh, of the river. And it shows these beautiful levees that, that separate the channel itself from the overbank or from the floodplain. And I'm very interested in my students, not only in, in how the river moves, and I won't talk about that today, but I'm gonna talk about the floodplain and, the, and this, this levee that connects the, the flood, uh, that separates the floodplain from the channel itself. Just to give you a sense of, um, of, these, of how important this LIDAR is, this is the, you know, that's the map from Google Earth. It's a very vegetated floodplain that's what the bare earth looks like. And all of that is real. And before we had these kinds of maps, I could wander around in the forest and, and try to survey things, but I'd always wonder, am I, am I imagining this or is it actually there? This kind of data that can remove the vegetation has changed the kind of work that we're able to do in these areas. So we're gonna look at levees. So we have a lot of topographic data from this area, and this is again time-lapse, high-resolution topography. That allows, I'm interested in the hydraulics of rivers as they go to the coastline. It's, uh, and particularly because I I'm interested in how sand gets to the coastline to be, build beaches. And as you go from an area of, of quasi-normal flow and quasi-normal well, quasi depth and quasi-uniform flow into the gradually varying flow area that geologists tend to call the backwater zone. Uh, the transport becomes very, very different. You know, the, the whole bottom of the channel is, is well below sea level. Even the water surface is essentially right at sea level. But we're not gonna talk about that part today. Today we're gonna look between the orange and the yellow here, and that topography is the topography of the levee. And it's that topography of one or two meters that that separates the flood from, from the channel. And how does that build and, and when does it build? We can, I, I study it here because we have a lot of storms and we have a lot of flooding. And this place floods so much that people don't live there. It's one of the few parts of our coast that is, that is a nature preserve because no one can figure out how to survive there. It's, it's, it's too inhospitable, but that makes it great for me as a scientist. It makes it a wonderful natural laboratory. Here's what it looks like after a flood. This is, this is the original deposit that I've sort of outlined. You can see it back here. Here's another flood deposit. You get this waves of sediment that come out onto the coast. I mean, out of the channel, excuse me, onto the, onto the floodplain. They're full of sedimentary structures and very complicated patterns of erosion and deposition. And I can try to invert the topography and the grain size and the structures. But what I really want to do at the same time is actually make measurements while the floods are happening. So we have cameras up in trees everywhere watching the floods. And then we have monitoring systems on the floodplain as, as well. But Hurricane Harvey, we weren't predicted, we weren't prepared for. Hurricane, so here's Houston. It's our big city. The Trinity River is, is, just, is just right out here. And this event that deposited this 1.1 meters of water, rained over a meter of water in two days, allowed us to, to try to understand the flows that, that build the floodplain that, that we actually see. Here's an example of the, what the gauge and the stage did. Um, first, this is the gauge height. Now, we're in the US, and unfortunately, we still use feet. But you can see this is a little over, this is 35 feet. So you know, this is the, the, the river water surface went up a little over, over 10 meters in um, actually, uh, you know, about, about two days, if you're going to be generous, a day and a half. And it rained 1.1 meters, and then the gauge failed. So 
It probably actually rained about 1.4 meters, but we don't actually have a, a, a direct record of that. So what does this actually look like? So, so for the students here, I wonder if you do this. So what we did is we went out and measured. So what you're now going to watch is a video of some of my students. Uh, I turned off the sound because the language is very colorful. So, um, but you can probably see here's an acoustic Doppler volosimeter occasionally on the side there. This is the forest on the floodplain, and there's, they're in uh, one and a half meters of water that is actually pouring out of the uh, river. And so hopefully you can see that right, right here. There's the river. Um, and it's, it's moving really, really quickly. Um, and here are the measurements of that. So we're going to just follow one of these floodplain channels down. And so these are each monitoring stations where they measured both sediment transport and fluid velocity. And this, these are the velocities, depth average velocities, um, going out to almost, you know, well, going out 400 kilom excuse me, 400 meters out onto the, onto the floodplain. So through a considerable forest, a very dense forest. You can see the, the exiting velocities here, and you can see the, the flow velocities here. The exit, exiting velocities were, were 70 to 80 centimeters a second which is a pretty high coastal river velocity period, and yet this is flowing through the forest, and it, and it didn't decrease very quickly. I had expected it would be almost an exponential decrease in, in water velocities away from the, from the shoreline uh, of, the, of the river. Instead, it was a linear decrease in and and, and water depths that were, were between one and two meters in, uh, in depth. This water was flowing so fast that it, and, and it was deep enough that it, was, it turns out it was flowing out of this bend of the river, because the bends go around like this, all the way across and then entering the river at, on the other side. So we had both a very strong river flow and then as much water flowing right over the bends across and moving a lot of, a lot of, a lot of sediment. So here you can see there's the channel. Here's my students in the boat. There they're pointing out like, they're trying to instrument, uh, and they did. They put up a bunch of uh, cameras and things in the trees. I, I forgot to bring the picture, but they, we went out a couple weeks ago to change the batteries. And the water here was two meters high, so it, and they put them up here. So we, we went out there, and we looked up, and we go, huh, how are we going to get to our instruments? And, and we tried to climb the trees, totally failed. So we, we have to go back in, in, in a couple weeks with a, with a ladder. And I'm not very happy about it because hiking, carrying a ladder through the forest is not going to be fun. But we now at least have a sense of what the upper limit on the velocities and depths that are associated with building these tremendous levees actually, actually can be. So uh, we saw that before. I want to end with um, uh, two slides about where do, we, where do we go and what does this mean for, for society? Because one of the things that we're grappling with and our challenge from our, the president of our university is actually to, to be societally relevant, you know, to, to, to not only do our science, but then make sure that it is presented in ways that, that the stakeholders, which are basically everyone who lives in the state, uh, can, can take advantage of what we actually know and understand. And coastal communities are a great example of this. And mitigation is a big, big issue. This is, these are now from going back to Hurricane Ike. This is in March of 2008, and uh, you can see this, this community. All these are individual houses. The, and all three of these maps are from exactly the same place. This is um, after Hurricane Ike came through. Almost total devastation. 95% of the structures weren't just destroyed, they disappeared. They were destroyed to the point that they were just timber and things. And this is what it looked like um, last year. And all the houses are rebuilt. They're even fancier than they were then. Um, this is the third time in the last 100 years, if I get this right, yeah, I think it's three, that this part of the Texas coast has been totally obliterated. And yet we keep on 
rebuilding it. And the question is, should we do that? And particularly, should we be subsidizing that through federally financed insurance? Um, I have opinion, everyone should have an opinion, but we need to ask ourselves, is this a smart thing to do? Or is there some sort of nature-based engineering, or should we live in other places to work on this? Unfortunately, this idea of nature-based engineering where we, we let transport help us, while that's been very well received in the Mississippi Delta of the US, what we want to do in Texas is essentially behave like the Dutch. The, the proposal, here's Houston again, here's that area that has been totally devastated, they want to harden the whole coastline. And this is going to cost, no one will actually put a cost to it, but the estimates are, you know, four to $15 billion, and I bet you those are still underestimates. But there's a big advocacy, there are a lot of people that want to see this happen, developers that want to see this happen, construction firms that want to see this happen. Well, I just showed you at the beginning of this talk that this coastline with each of these storms is moving many, many tens of meters. Uh, it's a really, really dynamic place. Uh, trying to build a hardened boundary to this coastline is, is going to be a challenge. You know, I personally don't think it's the right thing. Whether it is or not isn't the point. The point is that it's going to be a real challenge to try to do it properly. Because that river that I just showed you, remember, it also keeps things in. This is meant to keep things out. But we had over a meter of water rain on this whole area. And it took days to drain. I'll show some images of, tech, of, of Houston uh, this afternoon. Uh, but those days of draining would be even worse if we were to harden it on the outside. So I want to leave you, we, we have to figure out how to make this work and how to communicate the connectedness of the environment. Because if we protect one place, we may be making others um, much more uh, severely impacted by some of these events. So I'm going to, um, going to stop there. Hopefully you've seen a sense of, of us trying to get out and at least collect the kind of data for the models. I made a decision not to show you a fancy model result because I, I see those too often and I present those too often. It's getting the right kind of ground truthing and using the models to figure out how to collect the right kind of data that is, that is what, at least in the US, what we really re need right now. And I, I hope that you can get a sense of what that is and uh, thank you for your attention. Yes? I have a class I have to run. Ah, okay. I might as well get a question. Is there any blessing for the hurricanes? I'm thinking of dumping in some nutrients into the ocean for aquatic life. Anything that follows that you think about? How does that discussion go with that? Ah, yeah. Is there, um, actually, the biggest bl the blessing is not on the seaward side because it, it turns out that all the fresh water that comes out actually tends to set up a local anoxia because you get a fresh, fresh water lens. The blessing happens to be um, in the, in, there's a lot of farmland in this area and all of that flooding actually has, has, has really helped uh, add to, to some of those, some of the soils. So it, it's been good for agriculture. Great, thank you. Yeah. Oh, yes. weather events and there are a lot of concepts you mentioned the Dutch that um, go away from these kind of grid structures and move to more dynamic structures, yep. natural structures. Um, so I would be interested to which extent are alternative approaches to building a seaboard discussed in that kind of area and how that can be useful. So that's a great great question. The great question the, the question is that the Dutch who for many years led the way in just building hardened structures are now actually leading the way in, in what I call nature-based engineering, where they're trying to use the natural system, take advantage of it to, to build um, systems that are more accommodating of, of rivers or, or natural coastal processes. Um, in Texas, so far, not so much. But in Louisiana, the Mississippi River Delta, which is 
you know, just out over here where we're losing you know, a, a football field's worth of, of land you know, every, every couple hours. Um, uh, we are trying to, to do that more. We meaning the community. There, it's a combination right now, at least in the master plan, of, of some hardened structures to protect cities like New Orleans and Baton Rouge and some of the major infrastructure, and then a lot of softer engineering for, for areas of, of, lower, of lower population density. Yeah. So we're, we're, we're getting there. Um, it's, it's tricky. Can, can I just tell you something else about that area? The, for years, the river has been hardened in its banks, so we're losing all this land, but it means that the fisheries, the shrimp and the oyster and the sea fish are very near the towns. So the fishermen, and that's a major part of the economy there, you know, fisheries and energy are the big parts of that economy. They don't have to travel very far to get to their fishery. If we were to restore the delta by allowing the Mississippi to move, it puts, it's going to take those marine waters and turn them back into fresh water, and they're going to have to tr travel every day at least twice, maybe three times the distance. And you, you know, some people see that as, as a burden, even though it's exactly what stands the best chance of protecting future land loss. So it, there are a lot of advocates pushing in a lot of ways. The fishery, if they build such a big wall, I mean, all the ecology of the seaside will be heavily affected. Yes. And they will not collect what they are collecting today, not even maybe 15 or 20 percent. I agree. So the, 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 the point was that a hardened structure like this, th this bay is very productive fisheries-wise, and you're going to strongly affect that. So my guess is, Per, that it's going to be very hard ultimately to build this because, because while it solves the question of sh immediate coastal community damage, <coughs> there are all these other things that it would make worse. And so I think in the end, well, that's why this has been 10 years and it's still just a proposal. So, yeah, that's all I can say. Yeah. Yes? Ah, so that's, that's a great question, and we're, I'm not doing it, but my colleagues, so we, only with Hurricane Harvey now, know that information. My colleagues at, at Rice and Texas A&M were able to actually put out devices with high enough frequency content to, to find that out, and they're still processing the data. So. Stay tuned. All I can say is stay tuned. I don't. I don't know. I don't know the answer yet. But it. But it's critical for getting the transport right. And so, our our process so far, when when we started ten at Hurricane Ike time, the we put out pressure sensors in in pipes. They look, you know, they look kind of dangerous. And and we just put them out anywhere that we thought might survive. So we attached them to anything that we thought might survive. Um, we've gotten better and better at it, and now we, we, we've figured out, we as the community, not me, but the, the community which I'm part of, has figured out how to anchor things to, to get the kind of data that you want. So we're getting there. Uh, particularly with, so the question is, what does that flooding do to the, to the small plants and the grasses? It, um, it devastates them, yeah. Uh, it will, it'll take two or three years before the, 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 the various grasses and shrubs come back. So um, it's clearly been doing that. They do come back, and, and one of the things, uh, it, some of the native, more native species come back more quickly in these extreme environments. So it, I, it, it'd be interesting to, to see if, if it's 
affecting the native versus invas invasive species? I, I suspect it is, but I, that's something that we haven't yet determined. The trees survive, yeah. but, that, but the, the others uh, dis disappear. It's really severe with the hurricanes, of course, because the plants on the coast are, you know, there's a very shallow freshwater groundwater aquifer, so they're all freshwater plants. And the salt, I call it salt burn, but the, it, everything is, is, is killed for a while. And again, then, the native species come back pretty quickly, so it, it helps that way. What happens now if we reverse the flow and we talk about droughts instead of hurricanes? Yeah. I, in your part of the world, yeah. we're talking about hurricanes. Our part here, yeah. we, talk about, we talk about droughts yeah. and, and, and less water. Yeah. And, and, and so how, how do, you, do you think, I mean, yeah. what would you say about the other? Well, uh, so, the yeah. Flow, yeah, so um, I'm going to talk a little bit about those floods this afternoon, or one of those floods this afternoon. Um, the, I, I actually think that Austin is along an old fault zone that uh, causes relief of, of a couple hundred meters, but it's the first relief that all of the humid tropical air from the, from the Gulf hits. And so we are very prone to extreme rainfall, you know, getting 20, 30, 40 centimeters of rain in, in a day is pretty common. So we have a lot of flash floods, um, but yet we also have droughts. So um, I'm gonna talk about the role of soy, soil moisture in predicting those, those droughts. Uh, we have uh, this afternoon, because it's interesting how we can have 40 centimeters of rain fall on a catchment but if, if the soil is dry, there's almost no response in the river. If you do that three times in a row, that third event can produce, cause the river stage to go up, in, in the case I'll show this afternoon, 11 meters in a couple hours and with a devastating flood. So, so the capacity to store versus not store and produce these floods floods is huge. And, and one of the things that I'm not going to have time to talk about but I, in a talk, but if you want to talk about it, we actually have very large flumes, like 100 meter flume, um, a couple meters across, a couple meters high, where we make flash flood bores to look at the transport of sediment in the transient. So, you know, steady uniform flow is a great way to, great place to start to think about transport. But there's very little about a flash flood that is well characterized by steady uniform flow. So I could show you some great videos of that and what we're trying to do if you're interested. Yeah. Oh, oh. oh. yeah. One last question. Okay. Just uh, looking at the climate forms and the yep. mini cross section that you put, it looks interesting. I mean, they, are, they look like a condensed time frame of a much larger time frame yeah. when we look at the climate form in a hydrocarbon reservoir, for instance. Right in these shelves. I mean, do you capitalize on that for teaching? Because yes. this is a golden opportunity to show uh, models for teaching. Yeah, and, and in fact, so the, the observation was that there's this scale invariance in these clinoforms, that mini clinoform. I, can, I could show you a seismic image from, from the edge of the continent that had that same shape, but there the dimensions, rather than being meters and decimeters, are kilometers and tens of kilometers. And so, yes, I, I absolutely talk about, about that and make the case that, that it's, it's the, the spatial accelerations that set the patterns that you see in those, and, and those can be very scale and, and variant and give you those shapes, yeah. How deep <laughs> is the shelf on the seaside? Oh, that's, because we have geological models. I'm also a geoscientist. Uh -huh. Where, when you have a storm, things are removed from the shoreline back to the sea, mm -hmm. and then in normal days between brackets, most of the sand is brought right. back to the shoreline. Right. And that depends exactly on the depth of the shelf. Right. Right. And so the question was, how how deep is the shelf? It, it's a it's a it's a shallow shelf. It's a very shallow shelf. Shallow means shallow means out here. It it it. 
um, right here, I don't, between 10 and 20 meters. So it's very shallow. So it could be yeah. interesting over the next 10 years to, to see how much this, this sand is Right, and back. so that's what we're trying to monitor now. Believe it or not, right now, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Association is collecting the first high resolution bathymetric map of our shelf. Um, we've, we've, we've never had one, so, um, but we're, the wave climate here is pretty, uh, we have small wave, it's, it's microtidal and, and a pretty protected gulf, and so it, how it gets reworked is something that, that, that we're studying right now, and how much comes back. But are, yeah. Because there are such models. Yes, yeah, and we're, yes, and, and we don't have a, a very accurate one yet for here, but I totally agree with you. When you say you lose 60 kilometers, 60 square kilometers mm -hmm. per mm -hmm. year, are you saying as vertical erosion or real it, horizontal displacement? So that's a really important point. Um, it's, you know, it could just be going down the coast when we're losing it or going this way, and it's actually going this way. That's how much you lose, yes. the horizontal distance. Well, that, that's, at, yeah, that, that was just from that one storm. Uh, we, we have a tremendous issue with, um, land loss in, in our state, yeah. Even in those years where you don't have major hurricanes? Even, even in those years, we, we lose, on average, integrated over the whole coast, at least a, at least a meter. So, um, and that comes into, and then I'll be quiet, but that comes into, <laughs> you know, we've dam we, we need water. We're a, we're a stressed place. We put a lot of reservoirs on our, our, uh, our rivers, so we, we're suffering from that. How about adding artificially new branches of the major river into other areas in order to decrease the severity of yeah. the flood? And uh, it's been addressed. Uh, as soon as it's addressed, people say if you try to do that, you know, the state of Louisiana is going to sue the state of Texas. Uh, we so, <laughs> legal issues have kept anything from getting very far. Yeah. We'd like to thank Mr. Moyer.